Briefing on behalf of the Deputy Chief of Staff for the Operations, Lieutenant General Joseph Gastel Jr. will be the Division Chief War Planning Policy Headquarters Air Force. Attending virtual will be Colonel Matthew Hun. Give him a round of applause, please. Uh, hey, I, uh, I appreciate the applause. I am uh, not going to be able to meet uh, with uh, uh, the ability of Lieutenant General Gostella to brief you today, uh, but wanted to say thanks for uh, for having us. General Gostella had an unfortunate uh, uh, change of plans, an uncontrollable change of plans, so he couldn't be here, but he wanted to, one, congratulate you uh, on your selection to Chief Master Sergeant as uh, leaders of our Air Force, uh, and, and you know, it doesn't you know, when you look at the globe right now, right, from an A3 perspective, you look at what's going on in Ukraine, you look uh, what's going on in Indo-PACOM, there is a lot going on. Uh, and we need leaders like all of you uh, to be ready for the next fight, to be ready for the future. And so uh, that's an exciting time. That's a big challenge for you all as well uh, and for all of us. Uh, but, I, you know, uh, congrats uh, because that responsibility, uh, you know, you're going to be the ones executing and leading our Air Force into the future. Uh, so that's great. Uh, as uh, the uh, briefer just uh, mentioned, uh, my name is uh, Colonel Matthew Hunt. I'm uh, the division chief of the War Dogs uh, here within the uh, Pentagon uh, in A3. The War Dogs are responsible for global force management, or uh, GFM, uh, which is the allocation of forces across the globe, as well as the assignment of forces. Uh, so you can think PCSs, vice deployments. Uh, we work that on behalf of General Gostella and for the uh, chief of staff of the Air Force. And so what we wanted to do is really kind of highlight some of the uh, you know, ongoing operations uh, and give you a flair of what the A3, what the future holds now, uh, or excuse me, what, you know, what we have now and what we see in the future coming and how we're going to tackle that uh, as an enterprise. And so uh, next slide, please. Uh, should be a, really a thermograph here. It, in, in reality, this is the highlight. Uh, this slide that you see is the highlight that the Air Force is in the demand. If you look to the past, uh, we have been deployed for over 30 years. We never left Iraq, right? Uh, and for the last 20 years, we've had an all-in mentality supporting the CTVEO slide, head of the fight. But that's that's changed a little bit, right? We're out of Afghanistan. There's some different movements. The national defense strategy is highlighting how we need to face pure competition. And so this slide that you see highlighted with all the different colors isn't the past. It's actually the future. And it really shows that there's in, in, in an insatiable demand for air power uh, across not only the spectrum of conflict, either we're anywhere from CT, VEO, uh, all the way down to peacetime or to major war uh, and day-to-day -day competition, uh, but also across and through the different combatant commands. And so I don't want to highlight them all that you can see this, but General Bustella uses this to demonstrate the Air Force being in demand, whether it's strategic nuclear deterrence from uh, CONUS base locations here in North Dome, or cyber attacks, uh, homeland defense, uh, strategic lift, CTVEO is ongoing, space, the uh, indo pacom with Chinese expansion deterring day-to-day -day competition, and then you can say day-to-day -day competition with Russia or potentially crisis response. And so uh, this highlights, you know, the Air Force's, the strategic hedge for the Joint Force, and we're going to be in demand and excuse me, in the uh, future. Uh, a lot of these challenges are going to be really resting uh, on you guys uh, to solve. And, and so while I'll present Air Force uh, Force Generation and Air Force Pres uh, presentation, really it's going to be you affecting it and executing. And so let's move on to the uh, next slide. You'll say uh, today and tomorrow. When you look at the uh, strategic competition across the globe from the previous slide, uh, you know, from all the way from peace time into major war, as well as across the combat commands, there's a temporal element that's there as well. And we've heard the chief talk about it today with strategic competition. There's a demand, and there's really, a, a, you know, a fight between combatant commands who need the Air Force now, right? You think near term, one to two years. And there's also a demand for the Air Force to be that strategic edge, to be ready for that future fight. 5, 10, 15 years out into the future. And so this creates a significant pull, right, uh, with the combat commands, insatiable demand for the now. And how do we give airmen the time to train and be ready for that future fight we're highlighting? And so it really is going to take 
two efforts uh, within Air Force uh, uh, Air Force Force Generation or at Four Gen that we're going to talk about today. But there's really two significant challenges I wanted to highlight requiring the Air Force to change. And and let me say that again because you all have been in the Air Force for quite some time. As we implement at Four Gen, the Air Force is going to change. It is not going to be the Air Force that we've seen for the last 20 years with the all-in mentality. And so as an airman that's been around for a significant amount of years, right, uh, you and me both, uh, it requires us uh, to, to, to look at the changes and, and to implement them and change is hard. So I highlight that. Ultimately, Air Force Force Gen and Force Presentation are gonna make two uh, challenges, hopefully uh, enable airmen to execute in the future. The first challenge, will be how we present forces. How do we present forces to combat commanders? Because we can't fight the high-end fight of the future, think an Indo-PACOM or a UCOM fight, with how we've been executing in the past or think more of a CENTCOM uh, model, right? You have on the left a crowdsourced team, an AEW or a wing team that meet on the battlefield. They meet at the LUDs. They meet at the PSAPs for the first time. They don't train together. There's from 20 to 40 different wings. Uh, LUD is a great example. There's over 40 different wings of airmen that show up at LUD and they execute. It's a very efficient model, and it's good if we don't have to move around or if we have an airfield uh, that we can defend, but the future isn't going to be the same. And how do we train airmen not only to be ready to move very rapidly, as you see on the right, the ACE for Agile Combat Employment, uh, but also to be against a near peer, being able to disperse, being able to quickly reaggregate, and being able to know the airmen on their left or right and have trained together and certified so they could do these more difficult uh, concepts of employment. And so uh, we're going to change the way we present forces, and I'll highlight that here in a bit, uh, you know, not only from the wing level, but we're going to also change how we give them the, the white space in order to train. Let's go ahead and uh, move on to the next slide, please. The second challenge uh, is to build a credible team, like I mentioned, ready for the strategic competition of the future. And how do we give airmen and, unit, uh, and units the white space they need uh, on their calendars? What you're taking a look at here is the Air Force Force Generation model. It's actually on the right side, but I'll first uh, go on to the left. Uh, in, in, in the National Defense Strategy published in 2018 and in the Interim National Defense Strategy, there is no change. We need to be able to balance that. And the way the SECDEF directs that is through Deploy to Dwell and Mobilization to Dwell, or the SECDEF Readiness Framework that you see on the left. And his goal across all joint force is a one to three Deploy to Dwell. So if you're out for a six month period of time, you have 18 months where you're back at home in order to train for the future. And equally for our reserve component, a mobilization dwell of one to, one to five that you see highlighted. That joint staff uh, 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 requirement of the, uh, one to three, the actual red line is one to two. And so the joint staff immediately, our partners downstairs, they're trying to squeeze as much as they can out of the Air Force and out of the other services in order to compete for the readiness of the now. And so they're looking for a one to two model. What we're, and that's what you see there, the joint staff uh, there on the left. We're going to move to the right, uh, and so uh, it's going to be a 24-month cycle, six months per phase uh, that you can see highlighted, and I'll run you through it uh, very quickly. I'm hoping uh, most of you have seen this before, uh, but in this cycle, in the available to commit, which is from the midnight to three position, are those airmen that are, one, already in theater, think maybe deployed for the CTV EO flight, deployed into CENTCOM, but we're also going to have airmen that are ready to go, and they're part of the earth. Uh, you can see there the immediate response force. Airmen that are highly trained to the highest end of NDS capabilities, national defense strategy, the highest end, think near uh, peer or peer competition. Once they achieve that readiness, whether they're employed in theater or not, they're going to reset and move into a phase where they get back to the basics. That's going to require maintenance on aircraft, or it's going to require unit uh, basic training or airmen individual training in the next six month period that you see there from the three o'clock to the six o'clock position. Our goal is to uh, use that space and time and ensure that is free of any other tasking so that white space is cleared uh, and you can start to build and prepare for the next phase, which is, which is just that, the prepare phase. 
where you start to see full spectrum training come on online, collective training, unit OR, ORIs and the like, in order to be moved into the ready phase. And in the ready phase, while we don't plan in a day-to-day -day competition where we're at, you know, I think uh, six months ago, uh, where we didn't expect that any crisis was going to respond, we weren't going to utilize you, and it would still give uh, you and your units time to spin up to the high end, uh, and, and part of that would be ready for dynamic force employment, for immediate response force, uh, by doing certification exercises, bringing those back. But the idea would be to spin you up and not use you until you get back ready for the available to commit. Again, 24-month cycle, six months per phase, uh, and it meets both the low end of the fight or think rotational concern, current contingency operations, or all the way to full spectrum combat training. What that does though, is if we stick to this, and it's gonna be difficult to do that, but if we stick to this, ultimately we're offering slightly less capability to the joint force now in order to build capability and readiness for the high end fight of the future. It's a, not an easy fight. There's a, you know, Air Force like you, I've highlighted on the previous couple slides, is in demand, and so we need to make sure the joint staff uh, is disciplined in their use of scarce resources, LDHD, low uh, density, high demand assets, uh, in order to build that white space. Next slide, please. And I should have asked in the uh, beginning, uh, I'll plan on just going through, it's a big audience uh, on that side. Uh, listening, so I'll plan on going through the slides here, the uh, next few slides, and then we can stop uh, and hopefully uh, take some questions uh, that you all uh, have. So I'm on the uh, forces we present to COCOMS. This is a little bit of a busy slide, uh, but as I mentioned, we're changing what we present to the joint force, uh, and this is what I'm going to go over here a little bit on the slide. But we're also changing how we rotate or how we generate that force through the 24-month uh, cycle, right, the four phases that I just highlighted. They go hand in hand. Uh, when we present forces, we need to make sure we present not only for the low end of the fight, right? We've done that pretty well over the last 20 years, but we need to make sure it's ready and ace capable. Uh, we're going to need to present multiple capable airmen that can execute and easily disperse. And so that's a change, right? There's a change coming there. Also, we need to be able to sustainably generate how many airmen we can supply. And so that's where I'll go into the, uh, the LEGO model here that you see in the, uh, in the middle. The generate the mission is actually the easiest part of that fortune. Uh, it's uh, already in execution. In FY23, it'll be completely IOC with all our mission gen force elements. And you can think the mission gen force elements as fighter squadrons, bombers, ISR, any of the tip of the spear that is touching the, you know, the other end uh, will be highlighted in here. But where in old, you'd have a fighter squadron uh, ordered, but and then a maintenance squadron would be ordered separately as a different UTC. And then the intel that goes associated with that, the ECS that is associated uh, with those uh, uh, that squadron, they're all going to be tied into one. But again, very easy problem to solve, and we've already built it. If you had 48 fighter squadrons, you know, and this is just an example, you'd divide those up amongst the four phases, and you'd have 12 squadrons in each phase, that would be a sustainable capacity mover and around. Again, those are done now. But establish the air base and the operate the air base are a little bit more difficult. Uh, and it's really for two reasons. One, we want to build a capability uh, that we can provide the joint force. So take the established air base. That established air base is going to come from one wing in, in, to the max extent possible. And if it comes from one wing and it's married up with the command and control force element from that same wing, you can think that you're going to have the leadership uh, and potentially from a, a generate emission generation from that same wing, you're going to have all the requirements needed to quickly disperse from one location from your home station and move into theater. Uh, and you're able to train together. So for the first time, we're hoping by building the established the air base, the ACS Airmen, National Combat Support, from one wing, that we're going to be able to train and be able to uh, have units ready to execute uh, ACE, and we're going to talk about that here uh, more in a second. You can see what's highlighted. It's really what the Joint Force calls boss eye, uh, but it's, uh, you know, anything that you need to operate uh, one to two mission gen force elements for, for uh, 30 to 60 days from an, uh, uh, a civilian location. 
as we move, and again, established airbase will be from one CONUS wing, ideally, uh, or it could be a PACOM or uh, Indo uh, a UCOM assigned. As we move into the operate the airbase, that's where you're going to see that uh, if as we get make make wings deploy downrange bigger, we can't shut down Shaw Air Force Base. If we took 600 airmen from Shaw Air Force Base, it wouldn't be able to execute its mission at home station. And so you see, we'll still crowdsource some airmen in order to fulfill the operate and the robust air base, but that core of the established air base will be ready to go. I highlight this, uh, and maybe one more thing just to highlight real quick. We, we as an Air Force, if, if I'm going to talk to the Joint Force and say, hey, I have, in my example, 48 fighter squadrons, it's really easy to say, hey, you need 12 in that ready phase, and you need 12 in the available to commit. When I look at our ACS airmen across the spectrum, it's much more difficult to communicate how many security forces airmen we have, because we need some security force airmen that are from home stations. We need some that are guarding uh, missile fields out in Minot. We need some that are deploying to LUD. What is that sustainable capacity for security forces? It's a very uh, difficult puzzle, and it's really hard to communicate to the joint staff. Again, moving, if we can set, hey, and establish the air base, there's 69, 68 rather, security forces in that uh, established air base force element. I can clearly define how many established air bases I can build and I can communicate that to the joint staff. Next slide, please. So uh, as we uh, you know, kind of went through a piece of this, and I already covered this a little bit, as we look into the future, uh, you know, General Costello continues to highlight uh, here to the to the inside the building and uh, to the Joint Force team that we need to one be able to generate air power across the globe, and we need to drive a cost-imposing strategy to our competitors. Right, those two things are critical. And how are we going to do that? If you look in PSAB in 1991, it's efficient, right? If you can get a bunch of airmen on one locale, uh, it's a very efficient uh, way to execute air power but it's not very uh, survivable. It worked in the PSAB example, right, where we had complete air dominance, but in the future, uh, with different missiles uh, that could target the base and the like, uh, it's not necessarily survivable. And so on the right, you can see the hub and spoke concepts of ACE. And ACE is definitely still a nascent concept. It's being developed uh, all the way out in PACAP uh, to UCP, as well as to APSIN uh, and ACC and the like, but it's still nascent. The idea behind this is we need to be able to change the way we posture forces across the globe. And we need leaders like you to inform you know, how we most uh, uh, effectively execute ACE. Right? So again, like I highlighted, where there's ongoing efforts with multiple capable airmen, uh, where they're no longer distrained uh, to one AFSC's worth of uh, missions. They have many uh, mission sets uh, that they're going to perform, whether they're a maintainer and they can We'll do security force uh, duties as well uh, across the spectrum, right? That will make us uh, lighter and leaner and able to disperse much faster. Very similarly, we're examining AFIs, and you guys are going to be at the tip of the spear on, on that, making sure that we have instructions to our airmen that most efficiently use uh, the resources uh, highlighted. And we're changing the mission essential task list of units to make sure they're trained for ACE. So there's a lot coming uh, within the next uh, two years uh, that you guys are going to be, again, at the at the leading edge of at your wings and execute. Next slide. So, you know, that in the previous uh, slide, you saw the breakdown of uh, Japan, and you look at the hub and spoke, and that's what you see there on the left, uh, you know, the traditional classic definition of posture. It's what the Joint Force sees us now, right? You have Indo-PACOM, and Indo-PACOM forces being used in that AOR. But we need to change the way the Joint Force and the Air Force thinks about global force posture, which is if you move to the right, you can see the main operating locations or the hubs, and this is a notional example, plus the multiple ready and warm bases uh, across uh, the globe uh, there that are the spokes. But we also have forces from other combatant commands that can execute moving rapidly from CENTCOM into indo in this example. Plus, we have forces that are going to be highly trained and ready with their boss eye and ECS to move into theater to different locations. So think the immediate response force, again, a, a new concept 
developed in the 2018 National Defense Strategy, as well as dynamic force employment, a more dynamic presence vice a static presence that allows airmen in the white space to trade as well. I highlight that, you know, Chief Bass uh, highlighted hope uh, when, I, when I cut off A5. Uh, and so, you know, this is where we see the future going for the future fight. Uh, in, in, and that's not only to support the now, the readiness and the, the fight of the now, right, right in front of us, uh, but to go deep uh, into the future. Uh, and so I'll stop there on the, uh, the uh, brief. Uh, and, and why don't we open up questions then? And then uh, if there's time at the end, uh, while I'm not General Bustella given his views on leadership, I'm happy to share a few of my thoughts on leadership. So, uh, so over to you, I'll, I'll go on mute for a second. If there's uh, any questions, uh, we can go from there. Sir Chief Slad from SOC here. Uh, quick question on, as you talk about the the Air Force Force Gen and going through the cycles and the, the lead wing concept for the support, uh, is there any, or what's the, the vision or the look, I guess, on are we how are we gonna have to change the force lay down on, in the CONUS basis to set up that support to make it uh, seamless across what, what wing is the lead wing, over. Yeah, so, I mean, that's a really good question, and we're working through some of those specific items right now. And so, ultimately, as we define and take units or capability, mission gen capability, and we, we bring them into the different phases, we're going to find some gaps and seams where we need to change the amount of maintenance, airmen supporting those mission gen on that cycle, uh, you know, that we're going to have to change. And so, we're going to work with our A1 partners here in the building. And there's going to be two to three years of, of change going to occur, uh, you know, with, with, you know, I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but with our uh, program element codes, PEC, and then how we align those, whether they're FIC 1 or 2, uh, for those of you in the room that are familiar. There's going to be changes that occur in order to enable app or gen. But in reality, I think more of those changes are going to be enabling the high-end fight uh, of East ACE, really, uh, is where I'd highlight. Does that answer that question, I hope? Good afternoon, sir. It's Chief Simeon from 773 Logistics Readiness Squadron. As we mentioned, the F4 Gen and the packages that's going forward, the question I ask is that are we also considering the logistics and mobility piece of it? When we activate a base and remove X amount of fighter, fighter squadrons, inevitably there'll be a large logistic package that goes with that. Would the logistics packages also be activated simultaneously, or is that in consideration during the development of this plan? Yeah, that's a, also a really good uh, question. I appreciate it. Uh, so really two pieces to that, and, and like I hi highlighted, when we move and establish the air base, the airmen that come from one wing, whether it's Shaw or Scott, right, we cannot close down Scott Air Force Base and, and shut down one of our hubs, right, our logistical hubs. Equally, we can't shut down Scott. And so we divide, as we're, we're AFPC is working on this right now, and it's not an easy, it's an elegant solution, I guess is the right word. We need to make sure that we enable the ability to move logistics packages forward very rapidly, but we cannot shut down our main operating hubs here in the U.S. Thanks, Scott, right, Travis, and the like. Uh, so that's one piece of it. The second piece is if we're going to have warm bases, uh, and I don't want to get too much into A5 to a 8 lane, but if we're going to have ready bases, warm bases that are ACE capable, right, if we're going to be able to disperse very, very quickly between hubs and spokes, there has to be some level of equipment prepositioned. Right, preposition stock, preposition K loaders, fuelers, gas, uh, munitions at those locations. That that takes money, right? And that takes investment in order to have that. But that will enable us also to move very, very rapidly. There's host nation considerations, posture that we're working through right now uh, across the globe. But we're focusing a lot on indo pacoms AOR uh, to enable that. So it's really kind of a twofold answer to your question, uh, but. The highlight I want to say is when we built these force elements, uh, and this has been tried before in the past, right? It was very, uh, not similar, but it was akin to AEF Next, if you remember that, and that really failed. Uh, it, we're, we've rebuilt an elegant solution here to make sure we don't close down our CONUS base and our, you know, our permanent bases, right? Lake and Heat and like, 
to enable this structure. We are not going to shut down like the army. If you look at an army brigade when a, they leave, uh, you know, Fort Bliss, Fort Bliss will shut down as the division moves out. We can't do that. Air power doesn't work that way. Uh, and so uh, we have a, you know, yeah, I said this three times now, so I won't say it again. Well, it's an elegant solution. I think it's a very easy solution for our airmen to understand, and they'll see that in execution. Some of this, when we're talking about uh, enabling establishing air base and op operate the air base, uh, we're working through that now. It's going to go into effect in FY24, uh, and so we have a little bit of breathing room, and, and we're practicing that uh, also with, uh, as I think you mentioned in the last question, ACC's the lead wave. So we'll see some of that in FY23 uh, as they practice. And so there's going to be iterations, you know, there's going to be changes. And I'll throw that back at you. Who better to know what those changes are than, than our chiefs out there working with our airmen? Uh, and so uh, that will put the onus back on you, so uh, a little bit. Sir, good afternoon. This is uh, Senior Castillo. I'm an uh, air advisor out of Travis Air Force Base. So the question of looking at your model, it looks like a lot of the same, right, what we've done in the past trying to get uh, buckets and try to get bins and try to get temple bands and all that. My question to you, sir, is like, how does the small team element fit into this model, such as advisors going into a certain combatant command, standing up an airfield for whatever it is you would need them and have them do? How does that fit into this model and has that been considered? Yeah, and so if we have the, if you don't mind putting up the forces we present to COCOM slide. Uh, and unfortunately, this is a little bit of a, uh, it's not an older slide, but it doesn't have all the data on there. There are uh, some things, we call them demand force teams or DFTs. And they are, we're building those to go and be presented in the Accor Gen model. So if we build eight demand force teams of capability X, they will also rotate around the model. But they are really teams that can go out separate from the mission gen, separate from the established the air base. And so think an EMEDS, a medical capability that could go uh, to an austere location, it could go to a, a Navy base, and like these are demand force teams that can go outside. We'll define the number of the EMEDS that we can build, uh, which is underway right now, right? And the EMEDS is a good example because we've been really using our medical capacity uh, to support uh, COVID response. But we'll define what that, kept, you know, what, how many we can generate at a sustainable capacity in the model in order to execute. Very similarly, uh, air advisors. Uh, we've actually just recently had that discussion on how do we build that, how do we uh, pull those, because a lot of air advisors are coming directly from mission gen squadrons and the like, uh, depending on you know where in, in, in these other force elements. How do we separate it? I think uh, for air advisors, we don't have the answer yet, uh, to be blunt. Uh, we just talked about it, it's probably two weeks ago. Uh, and so we are working with the FAM currently uh, and the uh, team here in A3TR in order to build that one out. So I don't have specifics. Uh, that's a gap that we're still working. Hey, sir, uh, Senior Rodriguez from Offutt Air Force Base. So you mentioned the lead wing concept and the uh, it's a new way of doing business for a high-end fight of the future. And then you also talked about multi-cable airmen a little bit. And uh, so at Offit, you know, we've kind of, from a cyber perspective, we've, we've demonstrated that we're able to take a help desk technician and in less than three years, turn them into a, um, a cyber operator to defend the, uh, the terrain in support of our, the cyber terrain in support of our, our one of our ISR platforms. Um, so that's, that's good news. My question to you is, um, with the lead wing, and everything you've discussed so far, you know, how we do business, how we employ our forces, um, what new technology is gonna come with that? Because um, it, from everything that I'm, I've seen so far, we're still using yesterday's technology, the same stuff we used when we went into Iraq and things like that. So if we're gonna use yesterday's technology to employ a new way, in employing a new way of business, uh, how, how effective is that really? Thank you. Uh, so that is a zinger of a question. It's a really good question, uh, and I appreciate it. So I'm going to tap dance for a little bit and, uh, you know, tell you from the A3 lens what we're looking at, and, and then maybe I'll punt some of that to the A8 as we're looking at buying for the future, right? And so uh, let's, there's, in the A3, we're going to, you know, have 
execution, how do we employ, right? How, what's the concept of employment? And some of that goes to logistics under attack. How do we make sure we have our supply lines that can go from location X to Y uh, be survivable, right? And that will drive new requirements. Uh, and within those requirements, it's going to require new technical solutions, right? And so that's really the requirements driving the demand. We see that very similarly as we're starting to peel back and look at ACE, right? Uh, if we're going to execute ACE and very quickly disperse, what level of technology do we, do we need in order to share a C2 network that's, you know, a take a, what you would think of as a traditional, name it, let's say fighter squadron, right? And you break it into four different pieces in a calm and denied environment, what are the technical solutions and the new technology that would be able to support the communication so they can continue to execute and aggregate and generate combat power uh, when needed, right? And so uh, there's calm networks that are being looked at in, in kind of your example. Those are requirements driving demand, right? But uh, in driving the new technology, there's also movement afoot with the technology that will enable future ways to uh, employ Right, and so there's more to come on that, and so I, I kind of hit a little bit of that question, but I didn't answer that one fully. That's a good question. I think uh, A8 uh, probably is the better one to answer that one. Hey, sir, Senior Wesling, Ramstein Air Base. Uh, given the tensions in Ukraine and the Euro European theater in general, uh, and the real world operations and exercises currently taking place, I was just hoping you could share your opinion on the current state of ACE concepts of operation. Uh, what are we doing well? What do we need to do better, in your opinion? Over. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, there's a lot going on right now. Let me first highlight uh, app origin, and then I'll touch on the, uh, the A side of that question. So, if we're going to offer sustainable capacity, uh, and I'm on the app origin slide, if you don't mind going back to that. If you're looking at the right there, we have only so much in the available to commitment. And that's well where we want to execute as an Air Force. We only want to offer whatever it is, you name the mission gen force element or you name the amount of ACS airmen you, you got in, you know, established the air base. That's what we can sustainably generate. But we also are ready for a crisis response. And so we're going to have the next phase in the hopper that's already trained for the high end. There may not have trained with other units, right, with other mission gen force elements that are, you know, in that six month period think red flags or green flags, but they're going to be fairly capable and ready. And they may be at a, a C3 or C2 state moving as they continue through that. Well, we're right there. At, right now, in this time and space, when we look at Ukraine, we're looking at options to pull things forward out of the ready and move them into the available if required. And so that's our, our model has to be flexible, but it also has to be very, very disciplined. And we only dip into that ready phase when it's a crisis response, right? Which potentially Ukraine could be an option. As, as we look at ACE and different concepts of deployment, ACE is actually developing different in the different AORs, right? Where you see the hub and spoke in PACAF, you look at you know Western Basing Network in SITCOM, or in UCOM, you look at you know our allies and partners, it's gonna be different for every AOR depending on, you know, uh, you know, the atmospherics, the, what the competitor or competition looks like. Uh, and so, you know, I wouldn't, I don't want to go too much into Ukraine and talking about specific operations because that's a higher classification than we're on right now. Uh, but it, it affects how we're going to employ forces and how we can rapidly get them into theater uh, if required. I dodged a little bit of the last piece uh, question, but hopefully it put a little bit of perspective at least on the app fortune inside and how we're reacting to Ukraine. How you doing, sir? Senior Alvarez from uh, Joint Base Pearl Harbor. You mentioned in a few years, um, the Air Force is going to look different within the next 15 years with this whole uh, MU, MCA concept going in. You're at the unit level, we're being asked to develop the TTPs to go in and to see, make this concept work and try to bring it together. Is anything being looked at as far as the AFIs to give us that uh, leeway to go against some of the doctrines that we've been risk averse with the last 20 years? I can't sign red X's unless you're this, can't downgrade red X, can't pull parts because I need 2005s and stuff like that. Are we developing anything right now to give us that authority 
to be able to develop these TP, TTPs that we need to make MCA work? Yeah, so I absolutely love that question. Uh, and, and bottom line, we're not there yet, uh, but we are moving out on that. And so really there's two, two things that are changing. One, uh, the chief staff of the Air Force has highlighted he wants to look at every single unit in the Air Force and reassess their mission essential task list, right? We can't ask airmen and units to execute old ways of fighting and then ask them to do the new ways of fighting as well, right? To put it simply, because generically for all the different units out there, right? We're all different. But So we need to go through and review all our mission essential task lists, and that's underway right now. A3TR, our sister uh, division here that we work with quite a bit to Naval Aquagen, they're underway doing that review. That's about an eight-month effort for all, and that's a lot of work on the match bumps. Right, so for, for you, uh, all of you that are going to the match comes or are already there, you've probably already seen that uh, if you're in the A3T uh, realm. Uh, the second piece of that question, right, if you're looking at changing the mission essential task list at the unit level, well, we've had, you know, I wouldn't say a fight, but we've had some pretty good heated battles with our components. Think AF Africa, AF Sint, uh, USAP, where they are ordering up forces to be deployed to their AOR, and they're following our AFIs. And our AFIs are the gold standard. Don't let anyone fool you. If they want ACS Airmen, or they want Boss I, or they want Sec 4, they want the Air Force. Period. Dot. And I, when I'm saying they, it's the Joint Force I'm talking about. Because we have the gold standard in AFIs, and we need to make sure every red X is dotted, crossed, and teed, and we train our Airmen very, very well. But our airmen are really adaptable too, right? And so we might be able to get a little more, uh, you know, innovation out of them, if you will. And I, you know, I don't like these networks too much. But if we give them the ability uh, to change or to go through those AFIs and say, hey, do we really need to do this in this location? I know this is the gold standard, but if we want to be able to be light and mean and disperse very, very quickly, sometimes we're not going to have the gold standard. And sometimes we can use multiple capable airmen that are not trained all the way up to 100% but they're at 60% and we're willing to take risk, right? I think the chief, the chief, the chief is willing to take risk. It needs to be calculated, methodical risk, but we need and communicate it, right? And we're at peacetime right now, we need to communicate it, but there are ways to make sure we can execute the mission, execute it better, uh, and, and, and change the AFIs and give the airmen the ability to change the AFIs. And so we're, that was a long-winded answer. You got me excited there. I don't know if you could tell that, but you got me a little excited. But, we're working with fans here in the building to go and scrub our AFIs. Uh, and it's going to take a while, right? This is not an overnight. This is not a two-month thing. There's going to be back and forth as we build these force elements. The Lego slide I showed you, as we build those, that will kind of be to snap the chalk line and go, okay, from this, now let's look at ways to change those AFIs and build those multiple capable airmen, right, and move forward. So really good question, uh, and, and hopefully that answered it. Hey, sir, Senior Master Sergeant Powell from uh, Scott. Got a question. Uh, we we uh, recently see that uh, with the COVID-19 vaccine issues and the uh, extendment uh, extending of people over in the AOR, that DAV 81s became an issue. How is that going to impact this new AF4 Gen model? Because we know it's it's almost breaking the model we already have now, and and the ability to provide forces, whether they're DFTs or whatnot. Yeah, uh, so that's kind of a, a, a two-part question. COVID was very difficult on our current, uh, I'm going to write DAV81 down so I don't forget to come back to that, but COVID was a very difficult, uh, you know, strain on our current model. We had airmen both on the AC and the RC side that were stuck in theater for a long time, and then the next wave of airmen on their P-bands were coming in, you know, three months late. Right, and now they only do a three-month deployment. It messed up the cycle for the next rotation. So uh, there's a lot of perturbations, and you know where airmen felt the pain of COVID. And so that was kind of one one end of it. Very similarly, we have line remarks from our components saying, "Hey, we need this airman to be X, Y, Z." Uh, you know, and a, a perfect fit. Right, and kind of going back to the last question, we need a master sergeant. You know, with this color hair in order to come do this job, right? We have too many of the line remarks. Very similarly, now we have a lot of DAV codes uh, that are restricting the pool of airmen that we have. 
And so I, I kind of highlight those because all three of those are, have the name, the same net effect, which is our, our, you know, our supply of airmen. At Fort Jim, when we built that, we did not look at the demand. The chief uh, and the SECAP were very clear. We're building a supply-based model. Don't worry about the combat command's demand. Build a supply-based model. We'll come back to what the combat command's demand is eventually. But what do we have in our pool? And let's define our pool. And let's make sure that we, you know, we get rid of all those line remarks. Let's find a, hey, here is an airman that can execute that mission and is trained to these mission essential tasks. But it may not be the perfect line remark. And so in FY23, we have told the components that line remarks, and, and they're not happy, and I understand part of the reason why, but line remarks are gone. We're also equally going to the force providers at ACC and AMC and working on the DAB code. So there's we need to define what our capacity is and then make sure we put it in the force gen model to go out. Part of that, if you will look uh, in a, you know, take a wing. 100% of their ACS airmen, right? The, the Think of the MSG run on the base and the like. We're going to retain 20% of those airmen, Sky Air Force Base. 20% of those will always, you know, the billets really, I shouldn't say the bases, but 20% of the airmen will be at Sky Air Force Base. The remaining 80%, 20% will go in each phase, right? And we're working with this AFPC. It might be tweaked a little bit here and there. But if you can envision 20% in the ready phase, 20% in the available to commit, 20% uh, in the reset and the like. And you'll always have 20% at home. And so that will give wing commanders and senior enlisted leaders the ability to flex. And so if there are DAP codes, right, that are out there, you're not going to, you'll be able to take the billet or the face that's in one of those billets and move them in uh, for, you know, if someone got hurt or the like and kind of swap them out. Sir, Senior yeah. Renata from Herbert Field. So for the AFRGEN, gen, it seems like it's going to hit ops a lot differently than it's going to hit support. And we're kind of seeing that a little bit in AFSOC right now. So it's a lot easier when your main mission at home station is training and preparing and getting called for your downrange. But for personnel, for comm, finance, we have a huge home station mission that doesn't necessarily even translate to our down station mission or downrange mission. So are you guys looking at at all how we get manpower credit and is that going to be adjusted? Because right now we get credit for the commit phase because prepare and ready, we're actually doing our home station mission while we're doing that. But under this model, they're going to be away from their desk the majority, if not all of the time, for those 12 months leading up. And they're not going to be available to update personnel pay records and promotion records and provide comm support. So are we looking at how we're going to mitigate that home station mission or adjust manpower credit so we can keep our guys going? Because for us, our weapons are our people, and they can only be stretched so far. Hey, that was a, a great uh, input uh, and, and question. So, so when you say credit, I, I think I, I know what you're intending there. Let, let's first kind of look at a couple things. Let's take uh, let's take Travis Air Force Base, right? Or, or even better, I, an example I already use is Minot Air Force Base. And let's talk to first security forces. There you have an employed mission, so it's called employed in place EIP mission at Minot Air Force Base. There are you know, I'm, this, I'm making this number up, but there's 300 cops that are guarding the nuclear fields that we cannot take, right? we got to continue to guard the nuclear fields. So we're not going to take them away. And so it wouldn't be fair, and again, these are made-up numbers, if Minot Air Force Base has 500 cops and we take 400 of them and rotate, and now we stress them out trying to do that employee in place mission, right? Because 300 are needed to guard the fields. So what we would do is say, hey, that 300 is offset. We're not going to use those security forces that are guarding those fields, but we are going to take the remaining 200 and put it in the phase, right, for example. That would be similar to, to personnelists, right? I would I would argue that there is a home station mission for mission gen for airmen and individual training, right? So a personnelist getting ready for a deployment in our current model still has individual training that he or she needs to get ready in the spin-up cycle as they may move forward. It may not be until very close to the end of right prior to their deployment, but there are requirements. But like you said, there's also the home station mission. So I think we'll need to clearly define where, you know, as we say, we take 20% of personnelists out and they deploy and then they're, they need to spin up with their team for the EAV, right? Because there's personnelists in the EAV. We're going to need to find, you know, as we, we set those meters and we go, this many airmen, this many personnelists will be going downrange and this is the mountain that need to come from that base. 
we're going to have to define you know what that right thermometer gauge is over time because of the home station emission requirements and still meeting that but again there are some employed in place missions that we know need to occur that we've already accounted for in the model So I uh, am either uh, boring you to death or I've answered all your questions. I'm going to go with the uh, latter. Uh, I've talked to Chief uh, Bass uh, a little bit today. Uh, and, and, you know, if we go to the E slide, uh, you know, views on leadership from General Guastella. Uh, one, don't suck. Uh, but uh, I can't get in his mind and give, you know, what would have been a really great perspective uh, from a senior leader here in the building. Uh, so I thought I'd give you what I saw. Uh, I was a flu uh, uh, fighters for the Air Force, uh, and you know, from a, a, uh, a fighter pilot's perspective, uh, you know, what did I what did I like? What did I see in our enlisted theaters? And, and to be fair, you know, from a fighter squadron perspective, I didn't have as many touch points with our enlisted personnel as I wished I would have had over my career. But what I would say uh, for me is professional hunger and focus. Right, we need that from our leaders, and we need to instill that down, and that should be based on merit. Right, there's a lot of uh, discussion going on uh, on you know whether it's racism, you know things with gender. We should be basing it on merit, and so I've always a professional focus and hunger based on merit. The second thing would be an attitude, hire for attitude, train for skill. Right, uh, we can always train airmen, uh, but you hire for the attitude because that's what we need. We need moral courage. Do what's right. Too many times airmen are not doing what's right, and we need to go after them, right? If it's malicious, as leaders, we need to go in and change that behavior. Equally, if they make a mistake, we need to protect those airmen because we need a culture where mistakes, if we're going to take risk, right? Talk about that for If we're going to take risk, we are going to make mistakes, and we need to protect our airmen that are hearts in the right place trying to uh, make change and make some mistake, right? And that's going to occur. But when it's malicious, you need to make sure you go after it. And then a final thing yeah, I would say for leadership is be human uh, and be transparent, right? And so uh, it, there's too many times I've seen leaders where they don't have, you know, engage and, and let airmen know what you think, right? And so when I was a commander making decisions, I would be very transparent in my decisions. And I would tell what and why I made the decision to show the rationale from A to Z of why I did that, because I had time to do it, and it, it helped leaders underneath me grow. Uh, I Hopefully it built trust with them, uh, because when I needed to make a very, very quick decision, and I wasn't transparent, your airmen will trust you and follow you, right? And they'll just go, Poof. I trust that person, because I know how they think. So just a couple, I know you've uh, all been in our Air Force for a long time. Uh, and you have great perspectives. That's just coming from uh, Colonel on kind of where I, I bend my uh, leadership uh, and I'm moving forward. So, unless there's any questions on that, and I think I'm up uh, out of uh, time, uh, thank you for uh, one having me. Again, General Gostello would have liked to be here, so I apologize uh, on his behalf. He couldn't control the uh, changes there. Uh, hopefully, that answers some questions. If you have more on AFORGIN, and I hope you do, and I hope you have spears to throw at AFORGIN. Let us know, right? Let your MAGCOMs uh, A3s know, and we'll work it, right? Because there's changes, and, and we're going to iterate on this uh, to be better as an Air Force. So without that, I'll go on mute unless anyone else has anything for me. If they put my mic back on. Thank you, Connor Hahn, for stepping in. Thank you so very much, sir.